I, I felt diminished. I felt diminished. Je me sentais vraiment pas très bien parce qu'en fait, mon statut était inférieur à celui d'un animal. The state of things was pretty bad, and people could have given up. I remember um, a lot of people saying to me, you're kidding, the government doesn't provide benefits to same-sex spouses? And so we, you, you become reluctant champions, whereas we first started with just concerned about ourselves and, and, uh, and others like us, and wanted to deal with it as privately as possible. But once your case becomes the test case for the whole of the country, <laughs> you can't be very private anymore. We were so afraid of losing this case. At the time, you know, we were playing with big stakes. We didn't want to lose this case. departments that I worked with in government. One was uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the other one was CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency. Uh, often I did the work for those two agencies concurrently, especially when I was abroad. My career took me abroad quite a bit, uh, apart from having traveled to 65 different countries. Um, I was posted with the Canadian government uh, last was Indonesia, before that was Sri Lanka. Well, I started working for the federal government in 1990. Alex and I got together that, that year, towards the end of that year, and after we'd been together for a year, I knew that that year of being with someone was the definition of, of a common law spouse, as far as federal government uh, benefit stuff goes. Um, and so it was actually 1992, so we'd been together almost two years that I thought I would apply to put Alex on my benefits plan. Um, but of course, you couldn't do that. It was, it was refused because the benefits plan specifically excluded same-sex partners uh, of employees from being registered for payment of benefits like the extended health or the dental or the medical things. We went on our posting in 1991 um, in the summer. And just prior to that, there was a change in the collective agreement between the government and PAFSO, the Foreign Service Association, uh, where they added a non-discrimination clause, which said that all of the provisions and clauses outlined in this collective agreement uh, will not discriminate uh, against uh, anyone based on sex, religion, age, or sex, sexual orientation. Uh, in terms of dealing with same-sex couples, uh, there was really very little going on uh, at that point in, in the public service. I mean, uh, there, were, there were no benefits being provided, not only abroad, but, but domestically. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think what began to encourage us was introduction of clauses such as the one that Stan mentioned earlier, saying that there was to be no discrimination. So we made the assumption from that that we could apply for uh, benefits uh, that were being provided uh, to uh, opposite sex couples, which, which we did. And in fact, I remember distinctly uh, sending a telex uh, to, to Ottawa uh, asking them uh, which benefits we we uh, we would could be uh, entitled to, uh, given this uh, this new clause, and they responded, "Well, that was not the intent of the clause. It was just to give equal standing." And uh, and uh, we then asked, "Well, then, what's the purpose of the clause?" And we never got a response, not not a word. It's up to that time, um, they were tolerant in allowing Pierre to join me, uh, but they would not recognize him at all. Uh, so it was a discrimination that was more of making us invisible um, and not recognizing us as even being a couple. It, it was more that than the way we were treated by people. It wasn't uh, that we were put down, but the system itself 
uh, discriminated against us. It, you know, in terms of, of the treatment that we received uh, uh, while we were in Jakarta, I think uh, on a sort of day-to-day you know, interaction with Stan's colleagues at the embassy and the local engaged staff, I felt quite, quite part of that collegiality on an informal basis. But when it came to anything that required formal uh, recognition, uh, then clearly I was, I was not to be uh, treated as, as the others. I could not even call the embassy to report that uh, our phone was no longer uh, operating. Or there was uh, a problem with water. Or a problem with water or there was a power outage and, and whatnot. Uh, I would call the embassy and they would uh, you know, kindly tell me, well, you'll have to uh, ask Stanley to report that to us because uh, we can't accept your, uh, your submission uh, firsthand. Uh, we incurred tremendous expenses uh, in terms of uh, moving um, and uh, the, the transportation, all of the medical inoculations and so on that were needed for travel beforehand. Uh, the insurance that was needed to cover him for the time over there was hugely expensive. All of these things would not have been the case if Pierre had been a woman. Not even being married because in the Canadian system, if common law, opposite sex couples have been for many years recognized and given the same benefits as married opposite sex couples. So it, it uh, meant for us, financially, it was a burden, number one. Secondly, he had no status, but also with, within the within the Canadian community. It left us as being people with no real identity. Uh, it, it, there was just, just a, an aura of confusion as to how, to how to treat us. For example, in the house. The house that we were given was appropriate to a single individual. But even things like the water was polluted in uh, Jakarta and uh, the Health Canada had inspected the well that was available at this house and had condemned the water and said that uh, that house needed to be provided with bottled water. And so even there, th the water that was given was appropriate only for one person, not for two. So they wouldn't even give Pierre water. Uh, I, I mean, that's the kind of of, of discrimination I talk about and uh, you know I felt sorry for the people who were left with administering this because the orders were coming from Treasury Board. I guess the the difficult part of it was committing to being out because when I started working for the government I wasn't and I actually got out at work and I didn't want that to happen um, but I guess I got convinced at some point or other that things weren't going to change if people didn't sort of take a stand and be open about their relationships and, and I think I think the issue that really bothered me about it was that when I came to work you know after the weekend off or I was working shifts but whenever you come back after you leave people would always talk about what they did with their families or their significant other or whatever that and I always felt like I couldn't do that because I wasn't able to say that you know I, I have a gay partner so this is what we did and um, that's the part of it that, that bothered me to the point where I thought um, it, it's, it's not fair to have to edit out these sort of major details of my life because it's different from my colleagues and because my, my employer doesn't really support me being uh, in a gay relationship. So I, I felt diminished. I felt diminished and I felt that my authority um, as an officer was somehow being challenged. Um, it's not that I wanted ever to be treated better than anyone else, but in order to do my job as a diplomat, I had to be seen as representing the government, number one, and two, having the confidence of the government and of foreign affairs. And within the embassy, being known as someone who was not treated like the others, did not receive the same attention as the others, put me on a different level. 
and it, it introduced an element of confusion among not only the Canadian staff as to how I was viewed as a senior officer, but also among the Indonesian staff and through that to the larger diplomatic community and Indonesian governmental community that I, that I worked with. So it, it affected not only my personal feeling about myself and the way I was viewed, but it affected my job as well and my ability to do my job. We live in a country where uh, we have a lot of guarantees of equality and, and, and equal rights, but it seemed like there was a number of things, at least in the 90s, that were still lagging behind. And that was one of them, that gay families weren't uh, considered equal to uh, straight families. And so uh, myself and my same-sex spouse, common-law spouse, were not seen as a family the same way as uh, my colleague and their straight common-law spouse. And I just wanted to make that, uh, to, to, to eliminate that, that difference in the way uh, our families were viewed. Okay. So that, that, I guess, eventually hurt us considerably, which led to our, our submitting a complaint to the Human Rights uh, Commission. Well, the complaint that was filed was uh, that um, the federal government as an employer discriminated against its uh, gay and lesbian employees who were not able to put their same-sex spousal partners on the benefits plan. Uh, you were prohibited from doing that because your spouse was defined as someone of the opposite sex. So um, the, that was discriminatory on the basis of sexual orientation. And so uh, the complaint was uh, that the government would be able, would you know, cease that discriminatory practice and uh, provide uh, access to those benefits in a non-discriminatory manner uh, for the same sex partners of its employees. Notre plainte euh, portait sur un éventail très large parce que Stan était, était diplomate. Donc, il y avait d'abord quelques avantages sociaux qui ne sont pas normalement offerts aux fonctionnaires et qui, qui sont euh, reliés à ça, au fait qu'il est envoyé outre-mer. Et ensuite, il y a les avantages euh, de... de Il y avait des directives aussi qui s'appliquaient euh, aux, aux agents de services extérieurs, mais ensuite aussi il y avait euh, accès euh, au, au régime d'assurance maladie, au régime euh, au, au congé pour fin de, de décès, euh, congé euh, relié à des besoins de famille. Well, I remember um, a lot of people saying to me, "You're kidding. The government doesn't provide." benefits to same-sex spouses because they weren't the first ones to do it. They were actually laggards on that. There was airline, Canadian Airlines, there were banks, there were other organizations, big organizations under federal jurisdiction that already at that point uh, provided same-sex spousal benefits to uh, uh, same-sex partners. So uh, I remember people saying, really? They, they thought the government would be a little more advanced than that than they were. The history of the national security campaign against uh, gays and lesbians in Canada is part of an even larger international context. So I thought that it's important for us to talk a little bit about um, placing even our history of the national security campaign against gays and lesbians within an international context. The first instances of uh, gays being attacked by uh, a federal government or a government that we have recorded uh, and that we know about is uh, the State Department going after queers in the United States around 1946, 47, 48. Of course, the whole idea around this was that the KGB and the Russians and the evil East were interested in entrapping um, members of the federal public service, whether it be in the United States or the Australian government or the British government or the Canadian government, uh, in trapping them in compromising positions, uh, having sex with other um, uh, with Russians or other members of the spy agency in order to uh, prove that in fact they were disloyal, but more importantly, and use the entrapment policies or entrapment practices to try to get federal public servants to reveal country the state secrets. Um, so of course, this is all part of the cloak and dagger uh, atmosphere of the Cold War 
and uh, gays and lesbians, homosexuals get trapped into this particular discourse um, that creates a lot of problems, not just in the workplace, but also in people's private lives, basically from 1946 um, onwards. At the time, the cabinet and uh, the prime minister, so Diefenbaker um, and onwards, were being advised by what's called the security panel. And the security panel was made up of the top ministers and deputy ministers of the most important portfolios in the government. So the Ministry of, Ed, uh, of Immigration and, C and Citizenship, which is what it was called at the time, the Minister of Labor, the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Finance, as well as the RCMP commis commissioner. And the first instances of them talking about and thinking about how they were going to purge gays and lesbians from the, from the uh, civil service was basically in the late 1950s. So we're talking 57, 58. So the security panel in conjunction or in, in partnership uh, with the RCMP embark on this major uh, camp surveillance and interrogation uh, campaign against gays and lesbians. Now in this one very important document that we were able to get access to, there are three categories of what were considered possible disloyal citizens in Canada. Those people who are people who were vulnerable to revealing secrets. So the first category were adulterers were seen as at risk. Um, the second were people who were either alcoholics or gamblers. And the third were homosexuals. So there's actually this kind of language that's used in the documents. Once we started doing the research, we learned very quickly that the two first categories, being an adulterer or being a gambler and an alcoholic, were really not the focus of the security panel. What became the focus were gays and lesbians working in the federal service. This then gets expanded once the surveillance and investigation uh, and interrogation processes are, are put into place. This gets expanded to the military, and it also gets expanded to major urban centers like people working in the Ottawa area, in Montreal, and in Toronto. For the longest period, for example, uh, when these security purges were in play, um, and during the Cold War, the height of the Cold War, a security clearance, which is the most important part of making sure that A, you get promoted if you're a federal civil servant, or it allows you either to be stuck in a job. That security clearance was used as a major tool in the security discourse in order to either get rid of a gay or lesbian person working in the civil servants or basically keeping them in a, in a, in a working rut and not allowing them to be promoted. So by the time the 80s come along with the charter, with the passing of the charter, I think with the cooling down of the Cold War, the late 80s, by the time we get to the mid 80s, the late 80s, um, it's less and less likely that you're going to be purged or not, or not get your promotion if you put down in your list for your security clearance that your partner is a same-sex partner. That's not to say that the, the history and the past didn't affect people's decision as to what they were going to put in that form, right, who they were going to list. Um, but I think it was less likely that you were going to be purged based on this. In the 80s, the mid-80s, uh, gays were being fired from foreign affairs. If they were found out to be gay, foreign servants were being fired. Uh, others were being sidelined. Uh, they, you know, uh, mercifully, they wouldn't fire them, but they wouldn't allow them to do what they were hired to do. They couldn't go abroad. Uh, so it wasn't that long before this case that uh, it was scary to be known uh, publicly uh, within the public service and within the foreign service as being gay. I think to understand uh, Akerstrom and Moore and how it evolved in the uh, jurisprudence around uh, uh, same-sex rights and benefits, you have to understand where the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was at at that time. Charter came in in the early 80s. 
Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of guidance from the Supreme Court of Canada on how it was to be applied in practical terms until around the middle 80s. And uh, it was only at that point, 86, 87, that people started thinking about using the Charter to further human rights uh, causes and cases. And so, um, as cases were running through the courts addressing these issues and human rights standards were qualified, the issue of sexual orientation arose in the early 90s and came on uh, like gangbusters between about 1990 and 1999. And there were, there were cases which were addressing it all, over the, all across the country. And there was a case called Vogel out of Manitoba which um, cleared the way for that right to be uh, pursued in the Manitoba jurisdiction. But the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal system, which as you know, of course, is nationwide in its impact, uh, this was the first case to deal with that issue comprehensively. For federal uh, civil servants, I think that, that you would see uh, an incredible evolution and things do get better by the time the 1990s come along. Um, the, the visibility of the gay and lesbian movement has a big major play, uh, role to play in this, right? So as the gay and lesbian movement takes hold in the 70s and throughout the decade of the 70s, it's harder and harder for the RCMP or the security panel or even Canadian society as a whole to say there's something wrong with gays and lesbians because all of a sudden it's visible, right? Once people start talking about it, it doesn't become the scary thing that people are doing in the park at night. It's actually something, you know, it's your son, it's your daughter, it's your, it's your father, it's your uncle, and so on and so forth, right? So I think that all of that in, in combination actually makes it easier for federal public servants to uh, be able to see an improvement and that it's harder for them to have sort of job discrimination based on that. During the late 80s and the early 90s, I think the biggest thing was that the um, gay and lesbians were getting really active in the union. They were really pushing. There was a lot of frustration um, within the membership, the, the lesbian and gay membership, right through most of the 80s, uh, when there was a push for, for equal rights. Um, but the courts were really not going along. They were interpreting um, matters in the most restrictive and absurd ways. There was one court case in Manitoba in 88, a court of appeal case, I think, Vogel, where the judge actually said that even though the requirement of a spouse being of the opposite sex, sex had the effect of denying benefits uh, to gay and lesbian employees. It was not discrimination because those gay and lesbian employees had the same right to that benefit. All they had to do was to have an opposite sex partner. And he was saying this seriously. So, you know, the state of things was pretty bad and people could have given up because there was a solid no until the late 80s, early 90s. And then things had progressed enough that I guess the courts felt they had to. There was just well, there were there, was, there were breakthroughs, and that's what I was saying. It was you know yeah. the PSAC. We were just one child of many children that mm -hmm. were were taking on this this. Uh, but now, as I say, in retrospect, it just seems so ridiculous. We mm -hmm. had to do it, but let's back up when we had to do it. Um, there were unions that were taking cases, and uh, there were cases which we all were excited about that we didn't uh, initiate. This was quite important at the time because there had been efforts to uh, seek relief under human rights statutes on the basis of family status. And that argument largely failed. And so until there was an acceptance that human rights legislation must be read up to include sexual orientation, a lot of those claims were doomed to failure. The issue, a lot of the issue around the reason why their cases weren't paying attention to or didn't have the, the results that they wanted, they wanted at the end was because they didn't have the resources. So when unions come in 
and start shifting and, and seeing themselves as really part of this cause of, 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 of righting these wrongs, of creating some justice for gays and lesbians, um, and, and being part of these human rights uh, challenges, then you actually start seeing some real changes. And it, it just goes to show that, uh, you know, when you're, when you're asking for a major sh societal shift or legal shift, you, it's not just that you need, you, need a, you need like a perfect storm to be in place. You need not just legal changes, not just political changes, not just societal sort of ideas about things to change, but you also need major organizations and institutions like unions, uh, like, um, you know, uh, teachers or, you know, so on and so forth, or even the church even religion, to actually start making sort of changes and participating in particular ways for those changes to actually become anchored in the society in, 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 in important ways. And unions' roles in gay and lesbian rights and in, in, in helping to forward gay and lesbian rights is critical to why Canada has the reputation it has as being a place where gay and lesbian issues are quote-unquote respected. The first thing uh, we did is got in touch with PAFSOL, the Professional Association of Foreign Service uh, Officers. That would be our quasi-union representative. They then took it up with uh, Foreign Affairs, who said there's nothing they could do. The rules are established by Treasury Board on behalf of the Government of Canada, and therefore uh, there would be no changes. So then uh, we proceeded at the advice of PAFSO to uh, the first level of complaint for human rights cases. Now imagine this as being parallel to our regular court system. So the human rights courts have the very same status as other courts in Canada, but they deal specifically with human rights issues to expedite it and to build up an expertise. Um, so. The first level for us was with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And God love them for taking it on. But I have to tell you, the first two complaints that I, I made one complaint, and they rejected it because they felt they didn't have jurisdiction. I made another complaint. They rejected that as well for the same reason. I made a third complaint to them. And finally, they accepted it because I made the point that surely the intent of the Human Rights Charter was to protect all Canadians res uh, regardless of their diversity. And so finally, on the third try, they, uh, they did take on our case and they made it the test case for all of Canada covering the Federal Civil Service, the military, the RCMP, and all industries regulated by the federal government. And they united our case with the one of uh, Dale uh, Ackerstrom in uh, British Columbia and suspended a hundred other cases that were being considered at the time and uh, would make this then the test case that would establish the ruling for the others. That was the first level. We're talking first complaint being made in, uh, we were posted in the summer of 91. The change in the collective agreement was 1991. And then uh, probably very early January of 92, we made our very first uh, complaint. When I, when I filed my human rights complaint, I named both the union and the federal government as uh, respondents because uh, the, the collective agreement didn't allow for uh, same spec spousal benefits. And because the union is a party to the collective agreement, I named both of them in that. And what that did then, uh, when it came to the Human Rights Tribunal for the, for the hearing, the union was able to bring forward all of its information on how it had been working on through the 80s trying to get these kinds of benefits into the collective agreement and how they had basically been refused by the federal government. So um, it allowed them to present that information uh, as part of their defense to avoid liability in the complaint. So, Akerstrom, 
how did we get to Akerstone? As I said, Akerstone came because we were respondents. The PSAC was the respondents. And initially, it wasn't actually even with me in, in legal because uh, it was we had a human rights officer who uh, dealt with the letter and the complaint. And uh, essentially, the PSA's position from the very beginning was always that we support Brother Akerstrom's position. Uh, but we don't think we should be there. And uh, clearly, the Human Rights Commission saw otherwise. And I think it was probably the best thing that ever happened to us that they didn't write back at that time when we said we shouldn't be there and said, OK, you don't have to come. Because by coming to that tribunal, we had to start working on the law, and and uh, as I said, I think the PSAC came to realize how important it is to be a player at a human rights tribunal, and also recognizing the remedies that they could give. They can change collective agreements. So that was a pretty important breakthrough for us. Because they were a respondent to the complaint, um, they had the opportunity then to present a defense to say why they weren't liable for the discrimination. And so as part of their defense, they had they went over all of the attempts that they had made to get same-sex spousal benefits into the collective agreement going back to the mid-80s. So they had been working on that for, well, 10 years at that time uh, without being able to get it in, without being able to get agreement from the, uh, from the Treasury Board to have it in the collective agreement. Um, when some of the grievances went in and uh, the occasional the Treasury Board would give a little leeway and say, uh, well, uh, for compassionate reasons, uh, we will do it, but this is not a precedent. Okay. And that's why it became so crucial that we make the uh, collective agreement absolutely clear that same-sex benefits should be there. We had been involved in all sorts of human rights cases, in, including those involving uh, same-sex spousal rights, uh, since the mid-80s. Uh, both at the bargaining table, I think as early as 83, perhaps even earlier for all groups uh, that we were representing, and perhaps as early as 80 for certain groups, we had put forth bargaining demands for non-discrimination clauses that included prohibitions on discrimination based on sexual orientation. So up until the Akerstrom case, we had a victory but without a real remedy. One of the things that you really have to understand as respondents, Treasury Board took the positions that we were jointly liable, and there was, could be a significant, significant financial um, repercussion from, from this case. Um, so you have on one side, the PSAC is very supportive of, of, of what Brother Akerstrom was trying to accomplish. On the other side, there was a very real sense of, this could cost us a fortune. And uh, that was one of the interesting things, at least for me, on a legal sense. So we had to sit down first and get directions from the elected leadership of the PSAC what our position was going to be in Akerstrom. And I think that's something that, you know, I think Don and I both talked about this when you first raised revisiting these years. Um, there was always very strong support from the national leadership on this case. And they recognized that there was a potential. If we couldn't defend ourselves and defend our actions um, and what we had done, uh, that there could be a huge financial exposure. The other side of what they could have done was line up the Treasury Board and argued against Brother Akerstrom, which they wouldn't do. So they took a risk. There was a split in the union for those who believed it was legit to have same-sex benefits and those who thought that if we put that in that uh, it might take away some of the benefits they could achieve. Now the split wasn't a major split except for some of the bargaining units and they were really concerned and to be right frank about it, uh, mainly blue collar units. Uh, they didn't think they needed it, they didn't think it was necessary, they didn't even think they needed the no discrimination. So, uh, but uh, we were over there, able to overcome those things. Nous avons eu, en effet, une décision positive de la commission dès le premier, le premier palier, si je peux dire. Et par contre, le gouvernement a, a refusé euh, un processus de conciliation pour déterminer euh, ce. ce qu'on aurait peut-être pu recevoir financièrement. 
ils ont euh, voulu euh, euh, faire appel dès, dès le début et, et, euh, et le tout s'est donc retrouvé devant un tribunal et voilà personne. The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, which is a tribunal of three judges. And uh, it uh, was quite arduous and lasted for two weeks and required tremendous, tremendous research and um, uh, preparation. It was grueling. It was truly an emotionally grueling experience for me. And uh, I'll tell you why. There's an organization called EGAL, uh, Equal Rights for Gays and Lesbians Everywhere. And it is sort of the national uh, gay and lesbian organization that uh, uh, advocates on behalf of the gay and lesbian and transgender community. Um, and they uh, took up our case um, and uh, became one of the um, witnesses on our behalf. And they did research and found 82, they presented 82 pieces of evidence that showed that not only did the government discriminate against gays and lesbians, but they did so actively, not just passively but there were clear indications that the, there was an entrenched policy of discriminating against gays. And, and even within foreign affairs, I'm talking about 90, 91 period. To a certain extent, the government's, the government's defenses on pure issues of law were firstly that because the Supreme Court of Canada in Egan had rejected a charter attack uh, to the Old Age Security Act um, that the tribunal should follow the same essential approach. And what we were able to convince the tribunal to do is to understand that there's a difference between a charter attack on legislation which by definition gives the government some latitude in terms of what benefits it will provide and what it won't. And human rights standards, which govern, for example, how the government functions as an employer. That distinction was huge. And so our arguments, which were accepted by the tribunal, is we're not dealing with the government here as the government passing legislation. We're dealing here with the government as an employer and it's subject to exactly the same standards as any other employer subject to human rights legislation. So that was an important legal issue which the tribunal had to deal with. And the second uh, we've talked about briefly and that is the government argued that because sexual orientation wasn't written into uh, the Human Rights Act until 1992, there should be no remedy given to Mr. Akerstrom and Mr. Moore for any, any discrimination prior to that, and that was rejected by the tribunal. One of the arguments that was made is if you open the doors to same-sex spousal benefits, uh, it was going to cost a fortune. And I can give one anecdote from the, the tribunal, actually. Well, there are two things going on. At that point, there was a huge surplus in the pension plan. Um, that was before the government uh, uh, yeah, gutted it. So there was a huge surplus to start with, but I, I, there was an exchange between um, Justice Council, who was making this argument to the tribunal, you know, the, the worst case scenario, if this should happen, this is, you know, there's no way it can be paid. And um, the response of PSAC Council, who was Mr. Raven, as I recall, he said, well, think of all the money you've saved all these years you've discriminated against them. <laughs> <laughs> and there was just silence. But, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a bogus argument. There was, um, the reality was there were benefits in the collective agreements and those benefits were, were um, for all the employees of the, of the federal government and there was a segment of, of that uh, group which the government had just essentially been uh, refusing to pay and, and saving money um, by doing so. They had been using this as their major argument for why they were denying us benefits is because it would bankrupt the system. They couldn't possibly include more people 
um, and uh, the the system the, the medical system would be underfunded and so on and so they said well all right if that's your case then put the evidence on the table after a recess they came back and they said all of the documentation on the actuarial which would show how much it would cost the government is uh, secret uh, and it's all cabinet document and therefore outside the jurisdiction of this court to ask for it. The chief, the just the chief uh, justice at that time was not at all amused and he said don't give me this I know the way governments work you may have documents that are confidential because they're cabinet documents but you have files and you have until 8 o'clock tomorrow morning to present those files and I will tell you whether they are confidential or not. And then he called for a recess. The next morning they withdrew that as a reason for denying it. Subsequently we came to find out the reason they did that is that even their most ludicrous scenarios about how bankrupt the government was going to be ended up being something like 1.2 million dollars a year uh, and at the same time that Pierre and I and Alex and Dale were asking to have medical benefits covered for example or coverage at the same time the government health plan was enriching the services it provided to straits it was expanding so that you could have more psychological service, you could have uh, um, physiotherapy, uh, you, you could even have chiropractic service, none of which was in existence when we started our case. But they had so much money that they had to extend the services, number one, and number two, they had to cut the amount that people were, were donating because it was getting too rich. So the argument was clearly false. It, it was strictly anti-gay. It was homophobic. My concern was around the issues of remedy. And, I, and, I, and I'll give you uh, one example. One of the arguments that was made by the government was that because Sexual orientation was not formally read into the Canadian Human Rights Act until the Hagen Birch judgment of the Ontario Court of Appeal in 92. The complainants should not get any remedy in their favor prior to that. Uh, and what they put before the tribunal was case law that said when legislation is amended, it normally does not get retrospective or retroactive effect. And so they argued that. Sexual orientation was only added as a ground in the Canadian Human Rights Act in 92. There couldn't be a remedy for these two complainants before that. And we took that issue head on. And of course, the short answer to that argument is this wasn't new legislation. This was a declaration that the existing legislation was charter offensive. And if it was charter offensive in 1992, it was charter offensive in 1982 when the charter came in. And that's what the tribunal accepted. So that's another example of, of an area where uh, a respondent union like PSAC, uh, and, it, and I'll say here and now, uh, Catherine McLean was there for PAFSO and PIPS, the late Catherine McLean, and she did a great job as well for her clients. So it was a pretty united front that we presented and we were able to respond, I think, meaningfully to some of the technical arguments the government was uh, offering to oppose the uh, sustaining of these complaints. In Akerstowa, uh, one of the things that I remember that was um, fun on that case is we knew, uh, or we knew, we anticipated that what the the government would come back before the tribunal and say, you've only got one bargaining agent, the largest bargaining agent. Um, 
in the federal public service sitting in front of you, but you don't know what the other bargaining agents think. So you can't assume what the PSAC says is a, an ideal way to amend a collective agreement is what something everyone else would agree to. And we anticipated they might say that. And uh, so there was actually a national joint council meeting and President Bean and his assistant Mike McDonald, uh, we drafted up language, sure. uh, essentially same-sex spousal language, uh, and they went around to every president of every bargaining agent of the Federal Public Service and they all signed it. And uh, so then when the, that argument was made by the government, then we tabled this, this, uh, this document that had been signed by every president of every, every uh, bargaining agent of the Federal Public Service saying, we all believe there shouldn't be saying, um, uh, uh, the, the definition of spouse should drop uh, the the uh, yes well and it, it was it was fun Good the way it worked move. and yeah. uh, that was the sort of thing where we were thinking ahead but that, again that was all you know you had the president of a very large national union going around knocking on doors to make sure that uh, we had that that exhibit and we had it yeah. all seventeen bargaining agents right? yeah they all signed uh, if I've learned anything uh, after doing cases for more than three and a half decades is there are never any certainties and w one of the reasons there are no real certainties is you can never predict how a witness will perform in the witness stand some of them implode some of them perform beautifully uh, so there's that um, that question you don't know exactly what attitude the human rights tribunal will bring to these issues uh, the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada had rejected the um, Egan case um, gave us some concern that the tribunal might be troubled about doing what might be perceived as taking a position contrary to the Supreme Court's decision there. So were we concerned that we might lose the case? Uh, we, we were aware that that was a possibility, but I'll tell you candidly, uh, after uh, the law was accepted that the Canadian Human Rights Act included the ground of sexual orientation, there was no doubt in my mind as a matter of law and as a matter of fact that both Moore and Akerstrom were victims of discrimination in this case. And let, let me say as well, um, both Akerstrom and Moore performed superbly in the, in the witness box. Uh, Stanley Moore's evidence was so moving, um, everyone in the room was affected, and it's not coincidental that the tribunal elected to provide a, a significant uh, pain and suffering uh, damage award in his favor. The posting confirmation is the green light, it means you now go. And it gives the signal to uh, the um, uh, Health Canada to do all the necessary checks, the psychological questioning, interviewing that you need before you go abroad, uh, and then a very extensive physical examinations and what have you, extensive inoculations, stuff of that nature. And that is to be done with every member of the household. So because there's a lot of activity and a lot of expense involved in this, only those people on that posting confirmation would be covered. And so the posting confirmation also includes your pets. And in my case, the posting confirmation was for one person, me, Stan Moore, and one pet, Lady Jasmine. Now that then entitled Lady Jasmine to go through the same rigorous physical examinations that were required before she would be sent abroad and arrangements uh, for her trip to be sent out there including a stopover in Amsterdam at the the uh, veterinary hospital at the ho at the hotel to make sure that she or at the airport to make sure that she wasn't suffering stress and to take her out for for walks and to do a uh, doctor would do another examination before she continued her trip all of that, Lady Jasmine's expenses, were covered by foreign affairs. 
Alors, Lady Jasmine, notre chère chatte, était bien choyée non seulement par nous, mais aussi par la fonction publique fédérale. Euh, par contre, dans mon cas, euh, je n'avais droit à absolument rien. Euh, et ça, c'est devenu euh, chatouilleux, si je peux dire, au niveau euh, de, du tribunal, parce que j'ai été convoqué comme témoin et on m'a demandé comment est-ce que je me sentais face au, au traitement que j'avais reçu. Et j'ai dit, bien, écoutez, je ne me sentais vraiment pas très bien parce qu'enfin, mon statut était inférieur à celui d'un animal. Alors, euh, ils ont, euh, ils m'ont fait des gros yeux, mais pourquoi vous dites ça? Alors, j'ai expliqué que, bon, euh, Jasmine avait droit à toutes ces choses-là et moi, je n'avais droit, droit à rien. Et c'est devenu un peu une cause célèbre, je dois avouer, il y a un grand, un grand amusement, parce que lorsque le tout est ressorti dans, euh, dans les médias, évidemment, les médias se sont, à, se sont beaucoup penchés euh, sur notre chère Jasmine, qui était toute belle, c'est toute une, une chatte himalayenne qui, 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 aimait, qui adorait les caméras en plus. Alors, toutes les entrevues que nous avons euh, accordées à ce moment-là, avec les différentes euh, médias, Radio-Canada, CTV, etc., CNN, CNN euh, même, même CNN, même CNN euh, le, 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 le début du clip commençait invariablement par un énoncé à ah, Mademoiselle Jasmine, elle, elle est bien, elle est bien traitée au Canada, euh, elle est même mieux traitée euh, qu'un, qu'un, qu'un homme gay. Et donc, elle est devenue la cause célèbre, un peu, ou pas la cause célèbre, mais le, 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 le point de le point litige, là, qui, ou représentant du litige, fondamental. When I asked Foreign Affairs, how is it possible that you would be willing to cover the expenses of my cat, but not the expenses of my partner? And I was told, well, that's quite simple. People bond with their pets. It was difficult to hear the the guts of uh, how these two individuals and their partners felt. And uh, for me, it was uh, important to hear that evidence. Our case was finally heard and judged upon in 1996. In June of 1996 is when the judgment finally came down from the tribunal that found in our, our, uh, in our favor. Uh, now bear in mind this started in January of 92, so that was a long period of time to be in uh, suspension. A human rights complaint, once it goes to the tribunal, the tribunal orders a remedy if they find that there has been discrimination. And so they did find that there was discrimination and the remedy that they ordered was that the benefits had to be be, uh, provided to employees in a non-discriminatory manner, non-discriminatory on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, So they were basically forced to change the benefit plan to allow for same-sex uh, partners to receive the same benefits as opposite-sex partners. Le tribunal a jugé euh, en notre faveur, euh, non seulement jugé en notre faveur, mais a aussi euh, demandé à la, euh, au gouvernement de modifier, euh, je crois que c'est 83 quelques lois fédérales où il y avait euh, discrimination euh, face à la communauté gay. Et euh, à ce moment-là, le gouvernement a carrément refusé de, de, de donner suite à cette demande de la part du tribunal. On, on a suggéré que le tribunal allait au-delà de ces, euh, de ces paramètres. The government then decided not to accept the ruling and they appealed to the highest court for uh, human rights cases, which is the federal court. This would be the court directly underneath the Supreme Court. Um, And there was a a justice who heard our case again, and he brought down his ruling um, in 1998. So the whole process finally finished. Now, what's interesting about his ruling is that Pierre and I went back and said that there was continued discrimination from the government because 
they had done is they said that, all right, we'll give benefits only because we're ordered to by the courts to same-sex partners, but we will not allow you to use the word spouse. And in the definitions that were current in the government of that time, there were married spouses, common law spouses, and we just wanted to be called common law spouses. We didn't ask for a special category. Just take out that of opposite sex. And the definition was perfectly fine. But they said that they, that would taint the way the straight people felt about their relationships. And so they needed to set up a separate one for us. And we were called the same-sex partners and were not permitted to use the word spouse. In fact, I had been warned that if I used the word spouse in my correspondence asking for benefits, they would be denied. The Treasury Board uh, tried to avoid fully recognizing same-sex uh, benefits. And uh, they came back and tried to uh, get us to agree to some type of an appendix at the back of the collective agreement, which we referred to as the back of the bus, and we weren't having it. They, they said, well, we can make an appendix to the collective agreement. We'll create this uh, definition of same-sex partners, and these people will, these, these people will, all, <laughs> will all get the same benefits as, as, the, as the heterosexual members. And uh, it sounds like a heck of a deal. You could go into this tribunal and lose, you know. And uh, so you know, I can't make those decisions myself. I have to go to the leadership. And, uh, you know, obviously I, I gave my opinion of it, but I still, I still had to go and, and ask and, uh, because it wasn't offered. And so I talked to the head of uh, collective bargaining. And he said, I don't want to see my members in the back of the collective agreement. I want them up front with everybody else. <laughs> and uh, so that was one of our stories that came out of that. But there was always this, you know, if we just give this much, if we just give this much. And uh, when you're doing a case, there's always that pressure. You could lose the case. So do you take half a loaf? And, that, the, and Akerstrom was a lot about half a loaf. And uh, as I said, uh, and one of those conversations with President Bean, what he told me was keep turning up the heat. So we kept turning up the heat. Notwithstanding that the government tried to push through this uh, special clause for uh, people who were in same-sex relationships, um, you know, Canada likes to tout itself or likes to put the image out there that, you know, we were one of the first people to put, you know, same-sex marriage on the books that were one of the, you know, to recognize the same, uh, same uh, spousal benefits for the same-sex partners. Um, the government, uh, and there's a lot, if, there's a, uh, an important history, right? Just like the military were trying to get exceptions when the charter comes out so that they didn't have to deal with the sexual orientation part, <laughs> you know, to, they can't discriminate against sexual orientation. They wanted to continue to do that. The, the government, because no matter how many changes take place, whether they're legal changes or political changes or societal changes or, you know, changes because of visibility or major cases come to, to the fore around gays and lesbians winning major human rights cases, the, the underlying idea that same-sex partners is not quite the same as being a heterosexual couple uh, means that this federal government is constantly trying to scramble with, deal with the fact that, well, we, yes, we recognize them, but not quite, right? Because you're not quite really a couple. You're a same-sex couple. So this idea of being uh, queer is still seen as a problematic issue, and therefore the federal government making these exceptions or trying to find loopholes. It, it, it was astounding. The, the hubris was astounding actually as I think back on it. And I guess it hasn't really changed, but I guess I was a little more naive than I was surprised. Uh, that, uh, yeah, truly I was surprised. You know, the Government of Canada has passed legislation, human rights legislation and the Charter of Rights, and then it's the biggest problem or barrier in terms of, of uh, that's legislation actually mm -hmm. having um, yeah impact upon its society. It's, it is a strange situation. They act contrary to the very legislation that the government has put in place.
Yeah, it's not with the PSAC no, that's disrespectful no shame. of Parliament. It's Parliament <laughs> that's disrespectful of Parliament. <laughs> So I presented this to the justice, the chief justice, who was hearing our case and said that the government, although it has complied with the courts uh, in, in some aspects, it most certainly has not in spirit. And therefore, I charge them with continued discrimination against gays and lesbians. He found in our favor and not only did he agree with everything that uh, we were asking for, uh, but he recognized same-sex uh, partnerships um, and ordered the government to recognize same-sex partnerships, but he went further. And he said, I now order the government to cease and desist using a traditional definition of spouse. So that was the very first time that the possibility of marriage uh, was then put on the table. Because from then on, the government could no longer say a spouse was opposite sex. So it opened it up even beyond our case. And he also uh, denied the government's request. They were ordered by the Human Rights Tribunal to give an, uh, an, uh, a schedule of changing 84 laws that actively discriminated against gays. They were ordered to give a list of how they were going to change those and the schedule. Um, and they didn't want to do that, but the Chief Justice ordered them and he said, you have no more time, you have one month left. They were dragging their feet and they said, you've had enough time. So it was a total victory at that time. It, it was truly magnificent. And I remember his last words as the court closed. He gave me a final, a final word because I was representing myself, plus the Canadian Human Rights Commission, Commission was representing me. Uh, and after I finished, he, he congratulated me and Pierre for our courage in coming forth with this case. D'abord, euh, lorsque nous avons entrepris notre, euh, notre euh, lutte, euh, ce, ce qui nous avait guidé initialement, c'était l'accès aux avantages sociaux, parce qu'on croyait que c'était là qu'il y avait une discrimination. Mais avec la poursuite de la lutte, là, on s'est rendu compte euh, que la lutte était plus large que cela, que la définition de conjoint de fait, la définition de conjoint allait entrer en, en, en jeu et donc euh, c'est ce qui s'est passé en effet et au point où la Cour fédérale a déterminé que la fonction publique ne, pu, ne pouvait plus utiliser sa, sa, sa définition conventionnelle de, de conjoint de fait ou d'époux qui référait à deux personnes de, de sexe opposé. It just snowballed. It started from a case of a couple here and uh, Dale and Alex in BC just looking for benefits for themselves. And it grew from that into something that was going to transform uh, the uh, not just granting of benefits to gays and lesbians, but granting recognition and status by even allowing them to use the word spouse for the first time. I think as as the whole process gained momentum and, and you, were, you know the first layer of victory built uh, uh, onto the next and, to, uh, and, and uh, so it, it was it was became more and more gratifying let's put it that way to uh, to, to take the challenge on because at first we were uh, a little bit uh, hesitant. For workers it was the unions. Uh, it never would have come to the courts if it weren't for the unions. It never would have been considered by them. It's one of the things that the union identified for a, a, a number of years, that uh, there was inequality in, that, uh, in the way the benefits were provided. We have to remember that the, the, the way courts get involved isn't because a judge 
goes out and says, there's an injustice here. You get into my courtroom and I'm going to rule on it. There has to be a case. And that case has to be brought forward for him or her to consider. And it was the unions that, uh, that pushed for this. It was the unions that tried to uh, extend the inclusiveness of, co of the collective agreements to include everybody. Cases like Akerstrom taught the PSAC a lot in terms of uh, how a union works and how a union can work with its, its members and how it can uh, uh, move to change. But uh, so much of, of any organization is administration. It was really different sections of the union working very closely together. Um, we couldn't work in a silo and have ever come out with this victory. I know the CLC had been working uh, as a uh, on, on various uh, gay equality issues uh, for a number of years, as well as PSAC. It was very satisfying in that way because it worked the way it, it should. It really was from the membership. Um, and the leadership was, was principled and supportive. And the staff was, was interested. It was a real privilege to be in the position where you could be on the right side and and push for things and actually make some progress within what, as these things go, was a relatively short period of time. It seemed like a long time. Certainly a long time for people denied basic benefits and rights. Egal, uh, évidemment, avait à ce moment-là déjà entrepris uh, diverses initiatives pour qui questionnaient le gouvernement et ses pratiques euh, euh, homophobiques. Euh, et nous nous ont prêté main forte et ont prêté main forte à la Commission des droits de la personne par rapport euh, à différents témoignages qu'ils ont faits. Ils ont, ils ont soumis plusieurs documents qui représentaient le, le, la somme de leurs recherches pendant plusieurs années. Et donc, ils ont été vraiment, ils ont joué un rôle vraiment, vraiment important. Euh, comme comme euh, le syndicat aussi qui représentant, qui représentait plutôt euh, les fonctionnaires euh, qui travaillaient au service extérieur, euh, le syndicat a été vraiment très, 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 euh, très impliqué. Et les, et les autres syndicats se sont impliqués aussi. Euh, l'alliance à la fonction publique, l'alliance qui représente, pas l'alliance, mais le, le syndicat qui représente les scientifiques et les professionnels. Tous les trois syndicats, euh, syndicats ont travaillé ensemble pour pour euh, représenter notre cause. It, it's wonderful to have had that uh, that kind of support, and it, and it showed how broad based this issue was. I mean, they were all trying to make the government respond to uh, where people were at that time. We were lucky that we came along when we did with this. If we had tried a court case like this 10 years earlier, no. before the, the grounding had been set, it wouldn't have been successful probably. Um, and we're just a cast of, of hundreds of others who came before us with, with other chipping away at discrimination, with other court cases. Uh, um, and you know, as proud as I am about our personal role, in advancing human rights for gays, um, there are so many other others that deserve uh, um, thanks for what they've done as well. And without them having set the ground and chiseled away a bit, I think our case would have had a more difficult time. Ah, c'est sûr que ça, ça a causé, causé des, des stress, euh, des stress de, sur une base individuelle. Euh, moi, d'abord, je n'étais, je n'avais jamais eu l'expérience de vivre outre-mer, donc je faisais déjà face à des, à des stress que je n'avais jamais connus. Euh, stress de vivre dans un milieu très différent en Indonésie, c'est l'autre bout du monde littéralement, de plusieurs façons. Euh, mais en, à cela, donc, je pense que je n'étais pas unique en, dans ce sens-là. Euh, je pense que tous les couples hétérosexuels qui vont en poste en, ensemble 
font face à des, à des stress de, de ce genre-là. Mais à, à cela s'ajoutait le fait que je n'étais pas reconnu de façon officielle, qui ensuite ne rendait peut-être pas les poules les plus agréables au monde. Alors ça causait des stress sur mon conjoint. Et mon conjoint se sentait mal de me voir vivre ces choses-là. Donc, donc euh, ça, ça, causait, ça causait une autre dimension là, euh, pénible. Euh, mm -hmm. et, euh, et nous étions quand même un relativement nouveau couple, alors euh, c'était ajouter beaucoup de beaucoup d'épices de, <rire> la recette. <rire> We were playing out this whole scenario publicly. Uh, you, you just can't imagine <laughs> what it's like to be under the hot lights of the TV cameras. Um, and uh, like it or not, between us and, and Dale Arkestrom and uh, other champions of gay rights, uh, you, you take on a, a poster boy element that you didn't seek. It's just sort of given to you. And, and so we, you, you become reluctant champions, whereas we first started with just concerned about ourselves and and uh, and others like us, and wanted to deal with it as privately as possible. But once your case becomes the test case for the whole of the country, <laughs> you can't be very private anymore. And that added some stress to our relationship. But and that had the potential of going either way. Either it could have forced us apart. It's just too public, too stressful or it can force us, as it did, into seeking more strength in the company of each other. I am very pleased with the work that was done to get same-sex benefits. And if I want to be totally frank, I didn't understand it at first. And when I understood it, I can tell you that I certainly pursued it. I'm proud of what the union did. Um, happy that the Canadian Human Rights Commission took responsibility to proceed and set up tribunals and the tribunals acted, actually set up that time frame to complete it. A lot of hard work, but worth it. So the last little bit uh, was able to add in the, some of the other unions too. But, um, again, there's a couple of them that uh, when, well, there was four of us at least that said, uh, never believed we'd be up at a mic speaking about same-sex couples. But uh, we had talked before the item came up on the, on the convention floor and all agreed that it was time and we had to do it. Uh, you, you know, I, I'll tell you, um, I've really, really been fortunate to uh, to be in courtrooms, to be a participant in cases that have had an impact, positive impact, on workers uh, in the country. I started doing this work in 1978. To be frank, I, I almost had forgotten these cases. It's been so long ago, and part of the reason is because. Uh, um, Part of the reason is because when governments act in this country, uh, they are subject to charter values. And <clears throat> it gives you and workers generally a weapon that was not available before 1982. And when governments uh, make decisions that run roughshod over uh, workers, it's, it's, uh, it's great to have an opportunity take these issues on. It was a real privilege to be in the to be given the opportunity to be involved in a in a small way in uh, in fighting for something that was important that's important and significant and meant very concrete benefit to to members. It's not not routine that in your working life everything comes together so that at a particular moment you're in the right place to be part of something good. Uh, so it was 
just really uh, a highlight uh, for me of my working at the PSAC to be involved in something that was not only successful but substantially significant. Just good fortune. And my side is it was fun. I was thinking about, as you were talking about, uh, I'm sure you, you've spoken with Mr. Akerstrom, you will have spoken with Mr. Bean, you'll have spoken with Mr. Raven, who was counsel on the case. Um, all good people and interesting people. And uh, yes, it helps that we won the case ultimately, we being the group. Um, but uh, when I look back on it, I look back on it very fondly as, as a, a time when it was a lot of fun, when a lot of people were talking law and saying, how do we change things here? Oui, nous avons été euh, honorés euh, de différentes façons. Euh, D'abord, euh, euh, en 1998, je crois, euh, lors des festivités euh, euh, de, du Gay Pride à, à Toronto, euh, l'église métropolitaine euh, nous a confié une plaque euh, nous considérant comme des, des héros de, de la communauté. Et c'est une plaque qu'ils offrent chaque année à deux ou trois individus qui ont avancé la cause, je, je peux dire, de, 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 just, de, de justice vis-à-vis euh, -vis les gays. Euh, Stan a reçu euh, des, des reconnaissances officielles au sein de son organisation, euh, ce qui était euh, de vous dire. Moi, de façon beaucoup plus peut-être euh, euh, élémentaire, mais j'ai quand même été convoqué par mon propre directeur qui m'a félicité personnellement euh, d'avoir eu le courage d'entreprendre une telle chose avec mon conjoint. Donc, ce sont toutes des reconnaissances qui ont été euh, très, très importantes et très enrichissantes après une longue, longue lutte. Est-ce qu'on peut considérer que, bon, la lutte est finie, tout va bien aller maintenant pour la communauté gay? Et moi, je suis euh, un peu nerveux sur ce plan-là. C'est sûr que la discrimination est peut-être plus subtile, mais nous avons de bons amis qui vivent à Vancouver, une ville qui est très métropolitaine, où la communauté gay est très visible, très importante, mais qui ont été, euh, qui ont été euh, battus sur la rue à deux, deux coins de leur maison en, en 2011. Donc, la discrimination est encore là. Euh, C'est sûr que, qu a, que nous sommes protégés davantage maintenant, mais je pense qu'il ne faut pas prendre pour acquis que nos droits euh, sont, sont impermutables. You know, even as this is all exploding, the history of, of transgender people and the history of transsexual people is still silenced, even within the gay and lesbian movement, right? So I think it's really important for us, you know, yes, by 1990, the mid-1990s, there's major changes because all of these things are in play, but it, it's not the case for everybody around issues of sexuality. For So transsexuals in the workplace have very different issues and challenges they have to deal with than gays and lesbians. That's still something we need to deal with. The uh, victory, uh, dite victory, is uh, never certain. We have to be our own to my opinion, because the government changes, the politics change. When we're talking about uh, security, if we go back to the question of security, is that the, the increased instability that's happening internationally, whether it's economic instability or political instability. You know, what you start seeing with with September 11th and all these political, the political instability and the security instability and the economic instability is that I think we're turning back the clock a bit and that it's, and issues of insecurity, whether they're economic or political or security and security is actually allow federal governments, the government, or the police, to actually revert back to what they understood to be the people who were the social problems, right? Because there's a history of seeing people who are indigenous, people who are black, people who are gay, as being subversive, as being radical, as being outside of the norm. When we start to come to a moment in history where there's political, economic, and security problems, 
there's this reversion back to seeing these groups or these categories of people in our society as continuing to pose problems for us. And that this wanting of trying to find an answer as why we're having these instabilities, well, it must be, in a sense, the usual suspect, suspects, right? And these usual suspects take on. So I think that it's difficult for governments and for the police to, um, even in this historical context, to take away rights. It doesn't mean that they have to make things comfortable for people in this context. And they're constantly coming up with new uh, legislation, whether it's legislation around uh, security or whether it's new austerity measures that actually have major impacts on gays and lesbians and trans people, on people who are living on welfare, who are also considered subversive, on people on the left, on people living with disabilities. So, so, well, I'm, you know, I'm hard pressed to say, well, we're all in a bad situation. <laughs> we're not in a bad situation. I just think that we have to be super vigilant again, because when you start seeing this historical shift in economic and political and security instability, there's a reversion back to trying to attack or put under surveillance or under interrogation people that have been historically seen as problematic. Our history of radicalism, whether it's in, the, in terms of the unions, whether it's the gay and lesbian movement, whether it's the feminist movement, whether it's the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement, that these, these, this history of radicalism and uh, resistance is actually what makes everything we're dealing with today possible, right? So we shouldn't take what we have today is for granted because it took a lot of work and when I think about our, our forebearers, the activists who came uh, before us or who are still very active uh, and being radical, that that kind of radicalism takes uh, commitment, solidarity and uh, an incredible amount of dedication and sacrifice and that to sit back to think that, oh, here in North America, we have same-sex marriage, therefore we're okay, is actually naive to a certain extent. And I, I'm, I'm not using that word lightly, even if I know it's a controversial word, because I, I, uh, in order for us to hang on to the rights we have, we actually have to continue this commitment, the radicalism, the sacrifice, the dedication, whether it's, um, you know, volunteering at a, a labor archives, a workers' archives, or writing books uh, that are seen as controversial, or going to protests, or standing up to your MP. Um, these are all important little things that seem small, but they're actually really big when you accumulate them. You have no idea how good I feel about being a Canadian. And there's a little twist to this story. One of my um, responsibilities while I was in, Indo in Indonesia, I was a, called a counselor for development and counselor economics. One of the, dis the distinct responsibilities I had was in the field of good governance. Now, back then, when the Canadian government believed in good governance, um, we tried to uh, promote ideas of good citizenship, of governments working for the people, of serving the people, and of the whole role of government and citizens. And we had an extensive dialogue with many countries, especially countries that had dictatorships. And I talked to them about human rights. And we were promoting the whole idea of a human rights commission for their countries so that people had recourse when they had arguments against City Hall, which was so massive. Who could possibly stand up against a government? Who would have the resources? And so they needed a champion. And I was promoting the Canadian rights uh, commissions to be set up in Indonesia. They were very receptive. I never for the life of me thought that I 
would have to call upon the services of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. And yet, because I did, I have nothing but admiration for our system and uh, for our country. We are just so privileged to be Canadian. Well, I think one thing that would be different now is that people wouldn't realize that there was any difference between an opposite sex and a same-sex spouse. They're treated the same, they have the same benefits and the same, uh, the same kinds of uh, coverage. And it probably doesn't occur to people, that, you know, when they work for the government now, that if they happen to have a same-sex spouse that they wouldn't be able to apply for them under their benefits plan. So that's one thing that changes, just one of those arbitrary, discriminatory policies isn't there anymore. Monsieur le Président, aujourd'hui nous reconnaissons une partie souvent négligée de l'histoire de notre pays. Aujourd'hui, nous parlons enfin du rôle qu'a joué le Canada dans l'oppression, la criminalisation et la violence systémique à l'endroit des communautés lesbiennes, gays, bisexuelles, transgenres, queer et bispirituelles. J'ai espoir qu'en parlant de ces injustices, en promettant qu'elles ne se reproduiront plus jamais et en agissant pour corriger ces erreurs, nous pourrons commencer à guérir ensemble. Pour vous avoir refusé l'égalité et vous avoir forcé à lutter constamment pour cette égalité, et ce, souvent à un coût élevé, pour vous avoir forcé à vivre à l'écart, pour vous avoir rendu invisible et vous avoir humilié, nous sommes profondément désolés. Nous avions tort. It is because of your courage that we are here today, together, reminding ourselves and each other that we can and must do better. For the oppression, of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and two-spirit communities, we apologize. On behalf of the government, parliament, and the people of Canada, we were wrong. We are sorry. We will never let this happen again. Merci. Merci. You know, it was a great moment, uh, and it redefined uh, our relationship in, in ways that are not visible. You know, externally, it was the same. We were the same partners we'd been for two decades before, or almost. Um, but it changed something substantially. Um, just being married and being recognized by our friends and family, um, uh, having our relationship acknowledged like that was, was so affirming. And, and anyone who has been married, straight or otherwise, will know what we're talking about. It just brings it to a whole new level uh, that, it, that is really wonderful. And, and that is what gays wanted. They, they weren't trying to flaunt anything, their relationship. They just wanted to share in that, that sense of commitment and that, that affirmation that comes. At our wedding, for example, we invited 75 people and there were 75 people who showed up, everybody, including very, very traditional Catholics uh, who otherwise would have had you would have thought had difficulty with it but they just felt this was the right thing to do they've known us as a couple for so long it was the right thing to do and that was wonderful Thank you.